Author Julie Berry talks about the unusual way she frames her story in Lovely War and how she came to use this technique. To tell your sort of typical boy meets girl in World War I story would be a sort of historical malpractice. There was so much more about the war that I wanted to share, and so I needed an unconventional perspective. And I thought, well, what if maybe love personified were to be my storyteller? Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. And hello, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. I know some people in the country aren't, but we're pretty good right here in Iowa. That's true. It's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful July day. July can be yes. terrible here, and so far we've gotten pretty lucky on that. Yes, project. we have. Yeah. And I've been out of Iowa for most of the last two months, so it's good to be back. Looking out my window at the at the day lilies. It's day lily oh, season. Oh yes, yeah. yes. And what else? We have hydrangeas blooming. We have. Oh yeah. Um, well, the man- mandabias are really beautiful, and marigolds are coming on, and it's it's the high high season for flowers here. Mm-hmm. So, Mom, what do we have in store today? Well, today we have a, the most unusual book I think I've ever read, and it is, it is really um, interesting because it, uh, it talks about mythology. Some of the characters are in mythology, and uh, that makes it extremely interesting because it, <laughs> you think, oh, gosh, you know, you wonder if that's really happening, if that really happens. <laughs> That they're sitting around discussing us mere mortals. Yeah, right. right. And and when it was it's set in World War One and into World War Two, and it's just it's in that of course that era. There's a lot of books being written about about uh, times of the war now, and but this one is very unusual because of the mythology part. But uh, it also talks about uh, some other other things that that happened, and um, uh, for instance, the way that African American uh, uh, soldiers were treated and so forth. That plays into it and it's just very very interesting so i'm i'm really glad we're going to get to talk about it today and our guest is julie berry she's the author of the 2017 prince honor and los angeles times book prize shortlisted novel the passion of dulce the carnegie and edgar shortlisted all the truth that's in me and many other acclaimed middle grade novels and picture books she holds a bs in communications from Rensselaer and an MFA from Vermont College. She lives in Southern California with her family. The title of this book is Lovely War. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start with, um, as mom said, this is, some of the characters in this book are gods and goddesses. Are they, they're from the Greek pantheon? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep. We have Aphrodite and Ares meeting up in a hotel room for a romantic tryst where they're <laughs> captured by Hephaestus, Aphrodite's jealous husband, who imp- plays the part of a bellhop at this elegant hotel. The year is 1942. He catches them. He puts his wife on trial for infidelity. And to plead her defense, she spins two tales of love, describing why she does what she does, why love is still important in a modern warfare torn world and so we have a tale within a tale that's right and it's uh the 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 outer tale would be the story of the gods and their their meetup and of course uh aphrodite is not the only storyteller she's going to have Ares tell some of the war parts and she's going to summon apollo as a witness to tell some of the music related parts and of course we can't have a war story without death so we do have Hades making an appearance and so there there's just the outer story but within are two love stories the first being Hazel and James who meet their young British couple they meet in the final year of the war at a London dance and fall in love rather quickly as often happened during times of war and the other is the story of Colette uh, Colette Fournier a Belgian refugee who's lost her family to the German invasion of Belgium and she meets Aubrey Edwards, and he's an American serviceman, a member of the famous Harlem Hellfighters Regiment. And so he's both a soldier and a ragtime pianist in their world-famous band. And so that's the, that's the other love story for immortals. So 
this is a pretty pretty complex structure. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what, why you decided to do that, and and how that impacted how you wrote the story and the, how you wrote the book. Sure. Well, it, there certainly is a lot going on, and um, I, I perhaps. Partly that's because as I studied the war and tried to decide which areas I wanted to focus on most, I had a hard time choosing. I mean, there was just so much that was so fascinating to me about how the war changed society, how it changed, you know, women's lives, gave women the right to vote, how, you know, we think of Rosie the Riveter in World War II, but her mother was doing the same things in World War I, especially in Britain, uh, building bombs and, and working in, you know, war-related factories. Uh, I was fascinated by uh, the, the role of World War One in spreading American ragtime and jazz music around the world, and I was especially riveted by the stories of what it was like to be a serviceman in the segregated U.S. Army, facing it, as much, if not more, hostility from within the U.S. Army for the audacity of you know African Americans donning the uniform of a soldier and presuming to fight, as as they faced from the Germans. So. Um, it was there was just so much that interested me, and I just couldn't see not including a lot of it. So that presented me with a, a complex challenge, and I had to do a lot of a lot of weaving to make all those threads come together. But I I think that's what I like. You know, I I like to read a a book that has a lot going on and that's that's challenging and that has a lot of really gripping storylines. Just like you know, in a good television drama, right? You've got numerous storylines that really hold your attention and and so that that really speaks to me. This would make a fantastic movie or a oh, or a television series. <laughs> you really I would, would. Love to, to see that happen for sure. I, there's been a lot yeah. of interest, so we'll see. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did your interest in the Greek gods and goddesses? How was that originally sparked? Hmm. Well, so I knew that I wanted to tell a love story set during World War One. I. I had decided that, you know, we have an awful lot of young adult literature set during World War II, but not so much set during World War I. And I wanted, in at least some degree, to kind of look at the connection between the two wars. Not That's not the total focus of the book, but I wanted to at least pay some attention to how the, the one war sort of spawned the other and, and how there was this multi-generational aspect of a generation that, that survived World War I came home, got married, had children, and then their children had to go fight the, the next war. That that really got my attention. But um, I knew that I wanted to tell a, a love story set during World War One, and I tried to figure out how to do it. And um, I just I really struggled with the problem of point of view, because a love story by its nature is a close, intimate look at two people and and their feelings and their their very visceral uh, reactions to meeting one another and falling in love. And that's the pleasure of a good love story, that close, intimate perspective. But I felt that to tell your sort of typical boy meets girl in World War I story would be a sort of historical malpractice. There was so much more about the war that I wanted to share, but that required a much broader perspective, both um, sort of a bird's eye view of the war as a global phenomenon and a historical bird's eye view of the war as, as, a, as a chapter in history. And so I needed an unconventional perspective. And I thought, well, what if maybe love personified were to be my storyteller? And I thought that's interesting, but love personified is hardly the storyteller you would choose for a battle scene in the trenches on the Western Front. And so then I thought, well, maybe I also need war personified. And immediately I realized we already have love and war personified, and they're already secret lovers. And so that was just too good to pass up. And from, <laughs> and so I, I was familiar with the story from from the Odyssey of Hephaestus uh, forging a golden net to catch his cheating wife and, and cheating brother, and uh, and humiliating them in front of the the Greek gods for their you know, cheating. And so uh, I immediately decided to set that scene in a Manhattan hotel room in 1942 at the height of World War II. And uh, from from then on, it just flew. Whereas prior to that point, I had all kinds of beginnings that never really got off the ground. So as you were writing in in the book, you're you're sort of going back and forth between um, 
between the point of view of the gods and goddesses in this hotel room interacting with each other and then the story that they're telling which takes us you know right into the hearts and minds of the four lovers that you talked about um, Hazel, James, Aubrey and Colette and as you were writing did you were you, did you write in that same order where you wrote some in the hotel room and then you wrote the story that they told and then back to the hotel room or was it more jumbled than that I pretty much wrote it as you see it really wow <laughs> right I mean there were occasional times when I might have reordered something or you know decided that maybe something was missing and that I went back and added a, another perspective but for the most part I wrote it as it appeared and um, I, I'm not really a writer who outlines in advance at all. The only thing that I did do here was um, I had to keep a timeline of lore events and I had to keep track of where you know where certain divisions were at certain times. So so I attached James to an actual division of the war and so I had to, you know, study their their history and their movements and their battle dates. And then of course Aubrey Edwards is a member of the Harlem Hellfighters. So although Although there's this mythological twist to the story, the war events depicted are entirely true, right down to the time of day that the sun rose and the time of day that the shelling started and that the fog lifted and so on. And so I had to keep track of of, of the, those timelines of, of military events and then sort of construct a narrative that worked within those, those movements. Um, but... But th that was really it. I didn't, you know, have a plan of scenes and an order of scenes in mind as I started. I just, I just kind of dove in and wrote what came next, as far as I could tell. So, did you know what was going to happen to the main characters before you started, oh. or did that just come out of the telling of the story? Oh dear, no. It, it it came out of the telling, and in fact, that was you know the the ending of the story underwent numerous iterations before it arrived at the place that I was pleased with it. And, um, it, oh, man, <laughs> so, a lot of ink was shed <laughs> in, in, the, in the search of, for the right ending. Because we have, you know, four mortals and, you know, all these gods, and each of them needs the right ending. And I won't mm -hmm. say what right means. I'm not saying happy or sad or anything, but each of them needs the inevitable ending, except it took me a while to figure out what that was. Wow. Or, yeah. what, so. Well, I will say that last night I was reading um, the part where James is telling, uh, talking to Frank's widow, and, ah. and I was crying. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. <laughs> that means you did a great job. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, you know, I, I love that scene too. I mean, the subject matter, right? The war brings out so much tragedy, so much pathos, but also so much courage and so much love and so much real heroism. And I think, you know, those, those wives and children and sweethearts left at home were as much heroes as those on the battlefield, and I don't mean to diminish, you know, the, the sacrifice of, of those who served, but everyone paid such an enormous price, and, um, oh, yeah, that, that scene broke my heart, too, so I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Julie Berry, author of Lovely War. So, Julie, is this book considered a young adult book? I know that most uh, most of your past have been middle grade and young adult. Is it considered young adult? Because I certainly didn't read it as if it were. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it is. I mean, it's, you know, it's published by um, Viking Children's Books, but, you know, so Penguin, uh, Penguin Random House Books for Young Readers. And so it's a, it, you know, it's a YA uh, it's, it's marketed as YA, it's, it's shelved as YA, um, and that's been what I've been doing for the last little while. But I certainly see it as a crossover type of book. Um, and, you know, when I write a book of this type, and really when I write almost 
any book except for, you know, a picture book, I'm thinking about I'm not thinking about the age of my reader. I'm just thinking about the story that wants to be told. And because I'm an adult who reads YA so much uh, and reads middle grade, you know, and because I, and I think there are a lot of adults who really relish children's books, I, I just, I, to me, those demarcations are somewhat irrelevant. Um, so that's, you know, I, I just think a good story um a good story tells itself, and um, and and I, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of people ask me this question. You know, they said, "Well, it really feels like an adult book," and to my mind, that just means great. Then you, right. you know, you right. enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> it had something to offer you, but I certainly hear from teens quite a bit as well that they love it also. So, you know, to me, what what YA is and isn't, what adult fiction is or isn't, what women's fiction is or isn't, it, to me, I kind of throw my hands up in the air over, over all of that. And I figure, you know, that's that's for the marketers to decide or the librarians to decide where to put a thing. But I, I think a good story, you know, is somewhat universal. Well, I think the, the, the inclusion of the uh, mythology is a great teaching tool because for, for young people, a lot of them, I don't think they... I, I was a teacher, and I certainly never never taught them anything about mythology. I was an English teacher for years, so I think I think that's great because this is an important part of of, uh, of our culture. The culture of the world is the Greek and, and Roman mythology, and um, so I think that's great. I just I really enjoyed that that part of it. I really did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I had fun with that for sure. You know, um, some kids in some classes in school they they maybe have to do a unit on Greek mythology, but, but a lot do not. And then, of course, with the popularity of the Percy Jackson books a while ago, there are more kids, perhaps, that at least have a familiarity with who some of these gods are. But, um, and I love Percy Jackson, and I think it's great how, how those books you know, brought some more awareness of Greek mythology to young people. Um, but they're somewhat tongue in cheek, right? They're 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 playful, and and of course maybe mine is playful as well. But um, I do kind of jokingly say it's it's a it's a grown up Percy Jackson in World War One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Now so. there there have been a lot of novels written, some of them with at least an element of romance, not all of them, about uh, World War Two in recent years. I have not seen nearly as many about World War One. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I thought about that a lot as I was researching and, and reading, and, and I, I mean, I have a few theories as to why I think that is. First of all, World War II is just more recent, right? So we have mm -hmm. grandpas and, and great uncles and so on that fought. So it's just a little closer to our cultural memory, whereas, you know, nobody is alive today who fought in World War One, And, of course, we're... we're fast approaching that point for World War II. But, um, so there's that. But also, I think that World War II lends itself really, really beautifully to our ideas of a narrative in that it seems to us to have a very clear-cut villain, right? We have, a, we have a bad guy that we can point to, and he's absolutely a bad guy, and, you know, not just one. Um, we have a clear-cut sense of of moral imperative. There was an absolute evil that needed to be stopped that was rampaging across the globe. And um, there was a, a so, so we had a, a moral obligation to, to, you know, vanquish evil and restore good, so to speak, and liberate captives and liberate the oppressed. And uh, in America, we can certainly feel that we went in there and, and were heroic and saved the day and had a major impact on the outcome. So, so we love to tell the story of World War II because it's so satisfying from a from a story point of view, uh, or at least you know we're able to look at it in that way. The reality is always a bit more complex. You know, Hitler didn't come out of nowhere. He <laughs> he wasn't simply a madman who was evil. Uh, you know, he was he was part of larger cultural movements, and you know. Uh, he, the United States and the and the West and the Allies were not entirely um, pure, shall we say? You know, mm -hmm. in 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 all of our 
activities in the years leading up to the war. But leaving that aside, if you look at World War One, by contrast, you have to ask yourself, like, now how did it even start again? What was it exactly? And and who fought? And why? Did, when did it start? I remember there was an assassination, but 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 why would an assassination in you know Sarajevo cause a global war? So you really have to kind of dig back into high school history class to try to remember why World War One happened and who was fighting. And I think because the United States was really only involved in the final year, we didn't have as decisive a role as we did in World War II in its outcome. Neither did we pay the great price that the French and British paid over the long slog of the war. So I think because it's confusing, because it's much more ambiguous who was in the right and who was in the wrong, and, um, and you know, because really messy realities like colonialism and economic inequality uh, led to the war, and all the great world powers were complicit in those evils, it's just less fun to talk about. And so we don't. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you and you have to wonder. Well, so someone got assassinated. That's what started the war. I mean, you know, you, you have to really dig into it to to find out how that whole thing evolved. And so uh, the Second World War was much more straightforward. I mean, we knew, you know, there were, like you say, there was a bad guy and so forth. But right. Germany was um, the reason we got in the Second World War because Germany was upset because they were. Uh, punished because of the First World War. And so they well, felt that they were punished, you know, wasn't fair, and that's what that's why Hitler was able to rise to power, I think, wasn't it? It certainly was a major factor. You know, there, there were a lot of things that went into it, and I, I spent months just trying to understand the history and context of World War I and, and how it led to World War II, because I, I just couldn't even keep all the countries straight in my head, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the world was so different prior to World War One, yeah. right? We still had the Ottoman Empire, and and I mean, the the map of the world looked so very different. And of course, you know, the United States and Europe were were deeply involved in colonial activities at that point. So it was it was it had a lot to do with with that sort of colonial envy. And I mean, these are just things that we don't think about as much now. Um, but one thing that fascinated me was how. Um, you know, you, you had this this generation that fought the war in France, in Britain, in Germany, and they came home from the war, and the war had so changed them that in many ways civilian life, with all of its discussion and debate and, uh, and disagreement and all of its trivialities even and its, its absurdities and its hypocrisies, became a sort of alien place. To the to the soldier class that returned home, and and they felt other, they felt unappreciated, they felt forgotten, and they felt that uh, their countries had sort of abandoned the cause, the cause for which they'd sent them to war, and so you you start to have this formation of a of a military class that as it you know rises into middle age and into positions of authority still kind of can't shake the feeling that the battlefield is where you solve your problems. And and so so Hitler and his generation and his his cronies, you know, they they that was the soil they came from, a, a place of, you know, a, a, a place where you where you lived with your your rifle in your hand, and you you barely even slept for fear of what the enemy might do, and and you know all of human existence kind of boils down to us versus them. And then you come home to a, a civilian life that doesn't even begin to understand the realities that have become your realities. And, and, there's, and there's part of you that still can't sleep at night and that still kind of lives with a rifle in your hand, so to speak. And so, of course, another war was going to happen, right? You know, we, we had this, this, this class that came into power with a very militaristic approach to problem solving. And of course, that's just one of the many factors. As you say, the reparations agreements, I'm blabbing on like a historian, and I really should stop doing that. Well, actually, <laughs> but I guess that, that leads really well to one of my questions, which is, what is your background as, as a historian? Have you always just loved history? Um, did you study history? Did you want to be a well, historian? <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I never even took a history class in college. 
Oh, what a disappointment. Uh, no, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Well, I went to um, – I went to an engineering school, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I went to be a chemist, and I ended up changing majors and, and arriving in technical communication as my major. And it's not that I wasn't interested in history. It just just never really kind of fit into my schedule. You know, I took a lot of literature courses. I took all, the, all of the writing and literature electives that I could. Um, but I, I'd always loved reading historical fiction. I'd always been fascinated by history. And so even though it didn't really find its way into my undergraduate curriculum, I think when you're studying literature, you are studying history too, right? Like if you're taking oh, a Shakespeare yeah. class, you're, you're learning about, you know, that era. So, um, but as my life has, has progressed, I just find myself more and more drawn to the past, more and more drawn to nonfiction reading about history and about um, periods that interest me, but I think definitely it's literature that, that has pulled me into those interests and that fascination into why people did what they did once upon a time, why they thought what they thought, and why they, you know, committed some of the atrocities that they did, but also how they overcame them. So, yeah, I'm not a historian at all, but I'd like to hope that I sort of play one on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or, or on <laughs> the written page. <laughs> I mean, at this point in my life, studying and trying to unravel, you know, thorny historical questions is, is a big part of how I spend my time. It sounds like you d do a lot of very meticulous research to write. Well, to you write know, a book I like think this. I'm always so afraid. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't ever want to write a historical fiction novel and then have somebody say, "Oh, you really got this all wrong." <laughs> uh <-huh>. So. <laughs> So perhaps I overcompensate, but I do try to really immerse myself as much as possible and, and study a breadth of perspectives on historical eras. And where possible, I try to connect with scholars who can kind of point me toward the, the latest thinking in, in the history of any given you know, field or time. Because as we know, as we know, history is always evolving, that our study and understanding of the past is, is never static, even though you know, what's, what's done is done. But but we're always coming to think of it in new ways. So that that whole pursuit really fascinates me. So I feel really lucky that I get to indulge that curiosity and make a living doing it. I feel really fortunate. And also inspire an interest in history in young readers. I sure hope so. I really, really do. Um, you know, the thing that I feel so strongly about is that we have this, this great tendency to look at the past as though it's not applicable to us, as though, you know, because people wore weird hairstyles and weird clothes and had, you know, outmoded technology and, and even, you know, some goofy opinions and tastes by our measure, that therefore they weren't really real, they weren't really alive, they weren't like us in any essential way. And, and you know, C.S. Lewis talks about chronological snobbery, and I think that we all kind of can fall prey to that, that error in thinking. And so I hope that good historical fiction will serve to help people understand that, you know, we're, we're not the, the pinnacle of human evolution, <laughs> and, and we are really part of something much larger uh, and something just as human as us that came before and that will extend after. So we're, you know, we're heirs of a tremendous legacy with a responsibility to, to think to, of the future in, in our actions. Now, The Lovely War is your fifth published novel. Do I have that right? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's quite a bit more than that. Uh, oh, let me think. Okay. okay. Well, I'm looking <laughs> I've at your web page, and, and the ones that are listed under novels are Lovely uh, War, The Passion of Dulce, All the Truth That's in Me, The Scandalous Sisterhood of Prick Willow Place, and The Emperor's Ostrich. Are there more? There are more. There are ah. a handful that uh, have have gone out of print in paper, but are still available as eBooks. My first two novels, uh, the, the Amaranth Enchantment and Secondhand Charm, and then I had a four book series which I did with my sister called Splurge Academy for Disruptive Boys. And I back in the day, I also did some um, work for hire under a pen name, so I kind of <laughs> lose track. But it's <laughs> something oh, like wow. that. Right, so, know. <laughs> are all of these? Would you consider all of them historical novels, or not? Um, well, I would say the first two have a fantasy twist. Uh, I mean, they're definitely fantasies. Okay. But they're they're set in a sort of 
made up, but otherwise pretty consistent 17th, 18th century quasi-European country. So I think even <laughs> in those days where I was doing you know, fantasy novels, I was still learning some tools and techniques of how to research a time period and make sure that I was not being wildly anachronistic in terms of what you know, how people traveled, what their money was, what their weapons were, what their tools were, thing, you know, things like that. And so, and then um, Splurge Academy, that's just pure nonsense, just pure humor. Um, and Emperor's Ostrich is, is definitely a playful fantasy type of world, um, sort of loosely patterned on ancient Persia, but with some twists. And then, hmm, well, so I've done a lot of historical, but but not exclusively. Uh, All the Truth That's in Me set, is set in a recognizably uh, early American colonial period, but I never mention actual places or dates. I wanted it to be deliberately sort of impressionistic and ambiguous. So it it certainly feels historical. There's nothing unrealistic about it, but I chose not to attach it to, say, you know, Williamsburg or something like that. Mm. And when was no, The Passion of Dulce <clears throat> set? So that is a medieval novel that's set in 13th century Provence, so what's now southern France. And that is, you know, very heavily researched uh, based on the uh, inquisitions into heresy that followed the Albigensian Crusade. Well, that I guess preceded and followed the Albigensian Crusade in southern France, which was a, a crusade fought on European soil to stamp out um, a heresy. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was the first crusade where Christians slaughtered other Christians for the sake of Christ. Um, very, very proud moment wow. in world history. <laughs> wow. so. When you start writing, do you have your characters kind of in mind, lined up, or do you, do you find them as you go along? Well, um, I think the first thing that pulls me into a project is the idea of the setting, uh, the the place and the and the kind of mood that I want to inhabit. Mm-hmm. And from there, I go in search of characters as I research and study the period, especially from a social and cultural point of view, what it was like for everyday people, how you know not just kings and lords and ladies lived, but how how commoners, you know, eked out an existence and so on. I try to study that as much as possible. And and from there, ideas for characters begin to emerge, and I start doing some writing exercises. And, and so, you know, by that point, I have, shall we say, my main character and a couple adjacent ones figured out. But certainly, new characters appear on the scene as I go. Um, I I think it's funny. You know, people always talk about fiction has to be character-driven, and there's an assumption that if the character wasn't the first thing you thought of, then your story can't be character-driven. And I, I think that's just completely wrong. Um, I, I hope and believe that um, that it's possible to create convincing, you know, emotionally believable, uh, flat and complex and deep characters, even if your first thought was, I want to write you know, a Victorian novel. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how I approach well, it anyway. <laughs> well, the, the characters in, in your book, the, in this book, they are they are affected by this, the, the war. That's part of their, it's, you know, they're definitely in, immersed in it. We have two soldiers and we have two women who, who are in the, um, in the, uh, uh, the core that, that entertains the troops and so forth, mm-hmm. and um, one is, one is a singer and one is a, uh, a piano player, so they're they're very involved in the setting, and so that but that that's what makes it so great, you know, oh. because that's that's part of their life, and then they go and then they have all these experiences because of the war. You know that was what really fascinated me, right? If you if you live during a time of war, and especially if you're involved in it at all, the war is the overarching reality of your life. And I think even for those at home, you know, the war was all that the newspapers talked about and all, you know, the the economy was shaped by it and, and, you know, the rationing and what you ate and what you could wear and what you could buy, where you could go, the war shaped it all. So, you know, sometimes we can live in a place where we may or may not be very invested in 
global events or political events. We can tune in or tune out as we choose. But I think if you lived in Europe during either of the great wars, there was no escaping that. No, that oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Julie Berry, author of Lovely War. Julie, would you like to read from the book today? I would be happy to. I have a reading that's actually the very beginning of the book um, set aside, and then depending on how long that takes, I have another short possibility that we could read if if there's time. So I'll let you tell me after I've finished the first one. Okay, great. So this is the very first scene. December 1942. I hear a rhapsody. It is early evening in the lobby of an elegant Manhattan hotel. Crystal prisms dangling from the chandeliers glow with soft electric light. On velvet couches near the fire, couples sit close, the men in officer's uniform, the women in evening wear, resting their heads on their gentlemen's shoulders. Restaurant garçons seat couples at dim tables, secluded by faux Greek marble busts and showy ferns, where urgent kisses may remain unseen. The orchestra warms up, then begins the strains of I Hear a Rhapsody. A lady singer fills the glittering stage with her amber-colored voice. My darling, hold me tight and whisper to me, then soft through a starry night, I'll hear a rhapsody. She's not Dinah Shore, but she's really something. A man and woman enter the lobby and approach the front desk. All eyes follow their progress across the Persian rugs. The man, colossal in build and stern of jaw, wears a fedora tipped low over his brow. When he reaches for a billfold from the inside pocket of his double-breasted, pinstriped suit, the panicky thought occurs to the desk clerk that perhaps the man is reaching for a pistol. His black and white wingtip shoes don't look jaunty. They look dangerous. He makes half the men nervous and the other half angry. He's the kind of man who could crush you beneath his feet, and he knows it. But, oh, is he beautiful. His lady friend, even more so. She wears a tailored, belted suit of deep blue that fits her better than skin. Her figure is the sort that makes other women give up altogether. From the waves of dark hair quaffed and coiled under her cocktail hat, to her wide, long-lashed eyes peering out through its coy little veil of black netting, down to the seams of her silk stockings disappearing into her Italian leather pumps, she is arrestingly beautiful impossibly perfect. The scent of her perfume spreads its soft fingers across the lobby. Everyone there, man and woman, surrenders to their awareness of her. The tall man knows this, and he's none too pleased about it. Mm -hmm. He riffles a pile of bills under the nose of the stammering clerk and snatches a key out of his unprotesting hand. They make their way through the lobby with the man urging the woman forward as though time won't keep, while she takes every slow step as though she'd invented the art of walking. They carry no luggage. Even so, a stooped and bearded bellhop follows them up the stairs and down the corridor. The violent glares from the tall man would have sent others fleeing, but this bellhop chatters as he lopes along on crooked steps. They ignore him, and he doesn't seem to mind. They reach their room. Its lock gives way beneath the swift thrust and twist of the man's key. They disappear into their room, but the persistent bellhop follows them in. He clicks the light switch back and forth rapidly. Bulb must be out, he says apologetically. I'll be right back with maintenance. Never mind, says the man. Bottle of champagne, the bellhop suggests. Scram, the man tells him. He and his lovely companion disappear down the narrow hallway, past the closet and bath, and into the tastefully decorated suite. As you like, the bellhop replies. They hear the door open and shut. In an instant, they are in each other's arms. Shoes are kicked off, hats tossed aside, jacket buttons are shown no mercy. One might not trust this man, and one might even envy or condemn this sort of woman, but no one can deny that when they kiss, when these two paragons, these specimens of sculpted perfection collide, well, kisses by the billions happen every day, even in a lonely world like ours. But this is a kiss for the ages, like a clash of battle and a delicious melding of flesh rolled together and set on fire. They're lost in it for a while, until a cold metal net falls over them and the electric lights snap on. Evening, Aphrodite, says the stoop-shouldered bellhop. Mm -hmm. And that's the 
first chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. So, yes, I want to hear more. Sure. Yeah, it's a page turner. <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead a little. What follows, as I mentioned before, is that um, Hephaestus has caught the chief pair, and he actually encases them in a golden net, and they discuss and debate, and finally they basically arrive at a, a format where uh, Aphrodite is going to tell these love stories as, as a, a form of pleading her defense and explaining why she does what she does and why it still matters. And so she introduces us to Hazel and James, who meet at this parish dance in, at a London church in the fall of 1917. And they very quickly fall in love. Of course, Aphrodite is helping matters there. And so they dance. And you know, as so often happens, when sweet and innocent young hearts dance for the first time, they, they feel something. And these two certainly feel something. And they um, exchange information and... I would say cell phone numbers, but that wasn't the world it was then. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, so, uh, long story short, James and Hazel make plans to meet the next morning for coffee, and um, so they meet they at a tea shop, and there's a fun scene there where they kind of get better acquainted, and now they're walking. They've walked home, and they're they're about to part, and. Um, They've made plans to attend a concert the next day, which is a Sunday at the Royal Albert Hall. So there's a, a regular Sunday afternoon concert there that they're going to attend. So this is page 51, and it's Aphrodite talking, and the chapter is called Goodbye, November 24th, 1917. James walked her to a corner within sight of the striped barber's pole outside the King's Whiskers. That's the barber shop on the first floor of her building. Neither of them knew how to say goodbye. Tomorrow, he reminded her, the concert. We can get some tea after, maybe. When should we meet? She chewed her lip. And what do I tell my parents? Let's meet at one o'clock, right here. He glanced at her. So I'll get tickets? She nodded. Get tickets. It was time to part. They both knew it. Neither moved. What's your Sunday morning like? He asked her. St. Matthias's. I play for the choir, she told him. The organist is overseas? She nodded, then shook her head. He died there, she said. So he's not there, but he is, because he's buried in Flanders. She couldn't meet his gaze just then. He understood. He tried to lighten her mood with a spot of poetry. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. Hazel muttered. It's rot. Don't die. It's all right, he said. I'm all right. About going. A lie and a truth becoming every minute more of a lie. So many have gone, and if I don't, somebody's got to stop the Kaiser. What could she say? That she wasn't all right with him going? Not one bit? James tried to break the silence. Was he a good organist? Not especially, she wrinkled her nose. At his memorial, you'd have thought he was George Frederick Handel himself. The rest of the day stretched before James as a yawning chasm of hazelessness. Mm -hmm. He longed to bury his face in her neck, even if it was wrapped in a scratchy wool muffler. But that was too soon, too much to ask of a girl he'd known less than 12 hours, a girl with whom he'd shared two dances and a cup of coffee. Excellent coffee, but still... Aphrodite had had a hand in the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so he squeezed her hand. Guess I'd better be moving along. She bowed her head. You've got loads to do, I'm sure. Would he kiss her? Hazel waited to see. Did she want him to? She tried not to stare at his mouth. So pretty. She was so, so pretty. At first it was the music, and then her eyes and her hair. But now he saw how entirely adorable she was. He should be beating off other lads with a stick. Kiss her, I told him. With a curled finger, he gently, quickly brushed her cheek and the tip of her nose. Leave now or you never will, he told himself. Till tomorrow, he told her. He turned to go. No kiss. One o'clock. A brave attempt at sounding like she cheerfully didn't mind and not being kissed. I wasn't fooled. 
There was no point in resisting or explaining it away. James wasn't sure what he dared call what he felt, but he knew his happiness belonged to the piano girl, whether she would take and keep it safe for him or not. And that was Julie Berry reading from Lovely War. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Julie, I wanted to ask you about um, Colette, the other girl who becomes good friends, best friends with Hazel, um, and is from Belgium. Mm-hmm. I did, had no idea that, that Belgium had suffered that way in World War I. Um, how did you find out about that, and um, you know why did you choose to have Colette from Belgium? Sure. Well, so when I started out, um, before I even had an inkling of who the characters in this story would be, my first task was just to try to understand the war a little better. I felt like I needed to be able to give a you know twenty minute overview of how it began and what happened in it to a stranger. (laughs) Nobody ever had to sit through this presentation, actually. (laughs) But but I felt like I just, I needed to be able to understand it and explain it in a pretty thorough way, which at the start, I absolutely could not have done. And so I dove into just researching the events leading up to the war and the events of the first few months of the war, just for starters. And of course, what I learned, which I had not really remembered, was that the first atrocity of the war was the German invasion of Belgium, that they they marched through neutral Belgium, which international treaty prohibited them from doing. And in so doing, they began the war because these treaties that all the major European powers had entered into to protect Belgian neutrality forced France and Britain to enter the war to, to defend Belgium in the event that anybody attacked it. So that was the first, the, the first real action of the war was German soldiers marching into Belgium. The reason they did so was that they wanted to swiftly defeat Paris before the Russian army could mobilize. They knew that Russia would be their bigger threat in terms of numbers, but it would take some months for the Russian army to mobilize and even get to the German border. Now, France and, and Germany do share a border, but it's in the Alsace-Lorraine region, which Germany occupied at the time and it's mountainous and it's heavily guarded with forts and so it would not be the way to get quickly to Paris but if you took the other side and you marched through Belgium which is essentially flat farmland you could get there much more quickly and so that was the plan the Schlieffen plan that German military command had been working on for years in the event of of a war against France And so they put that plan in motion and they marched into Belgium. And what they expected to have happen was for Belgium to peaceably surrender and give them free passage. But to their astonishment, Belgium fought back. And the heroism is is really incredible when you consider that something like four or five million Germans marched through Belgium with 150,000 Belgian soldiers there to resist them. So think of those odds, 150,000 to 4 million or more. But they fought back, and in so doing, they slowed down the German advance enough to give France and Britain time to mobilize and organize and get there to stop them. So the Germans never did reach Paris in World War I. The whole Western Front was a sort of lengthy stalemate in that push toward Paris. But because the German army was so... Um, committed to its very meticulously planned timeline of events, and they had this six-week campaign planned right down to the minute, right down to the last can of soup. Uh, (laughs) They were furious at the Belgians for resisting them and slowing down their plan, and so they retaliated with just the most unspeakable carnage. They went town by town and village by village, torching entire towns, raping, murdering, massacring men, women, and children, babies, elderly. Uh, You know, it's hard to know sometimes which reports are propaganda and which are not, but it seems that they, um, you know, nailed bodies to doorways in in crucifixion formation. Um, I mean, it was was just an atrocity beyond all description. And, you know, it's very hard to understand how human beings can do these things. I mean, war is one thing, 
And war is bad enough, but then when war turns into this kind of um, butchery and and the sort of gleeful uh, rampaging, it's hard to really know what to do with that. And the town of Dinant, Belgium, where I uh, had decided Colette would be from, was the site of the, the greatest massacre where, oh dear, I don't have the number in front of me, but it's something in the neighborhood of 800 civilians were executed, you know, like firing line style, again, including a three-week-old baby and people in their 80s. And, but mostly they were men of possible fighting age, so they, you know, they wanted to eliminate the threat of resistance and to instill terror. So it was, it was very much a retaliation and punishment for, for the army standing up to them. And so it was these atrocities in Belgium that, that filled Britain's hearts with, with sympathy and outrage and, and that really brought Britain's you know, rallying to enlist to go uh, plead the cause of, of poor innocent Belgium. And so that was very much the, the, the catalyst for what would follow. And interestingly, there's a little, little side bit of trivia, uh, one of the young women who volunteered to serve the war effort in, in Britain, in Torquay, um, was a young woman whose, oh dear, her maiden name is escaping me now, mm-hmm. but uh, her name was Agatha. <laughs> and she, she served as a dispensary, so she worked in a, a pharmacy, and she uh, provided medicines which could be poisons to Belgian refugee patients. And while she was fulfilling her job, she began to think about a Belgian detective who was good at solving poisoning-related crimes. And that's where Hercule Poirot was born. <laughs> from Agatha Christie. Oh, for uh, heaven's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> we, can we, oh. we can weave a tale of many things. Wow. So uh, in the lovely war, or it's not the, it's just lovely war, is set at a time when the Americans are just getting involved in the war. Mm-hmm. How, what was the like turning point that made them, made America join in? Mm. Well, there were several things, you know, for, for a long time, the United States wanted no part of this war that they did not feel concerned them. And that's an understandable position to take. And the U.S. had such uh, substantial trade relationships with both Germany and with France and, and Great Britain that you know it really wasn't clear to them who their allies should be in this matter. So they, they had a policy of neutrality for a long, long time. But um, a few things began to turn that around. One would be the Zimmerman telegram where uh, – a German diplomat, um, Zimmerman, sent a telegram to the, I want to say it's the Mexican ambassador to Germany, promising the return to Mexico of, I want to say, Texas and California and all of that territory in the event that the United States joined the war and Mexico joined the Central Powers and fought against the United States. So that was intercepted, and that created great outrage within the United States. But also um, the the British naval blockade of Germany had had made the Germans rather desperate, and they did have U-boats. They had you know early submarines in the mm-hmm. war, and so they began sinking. Um, they, they began kind of indiscriminately sinking even merchant vessels and and passenger ships anywhere in the Atlantic. Um, and so it was the sinking of the Lusitania that was sort of the yeah, straw that yeah. broke the camel's back. Um, so that, I mean, there were a lot of things, you know, uh, I think I think sympathy had slowly been shifting over the course of the war, but the telegram and the sinking of Lusitania are sort of the official turning points in, in U.S. I never heard of that telegram before. Mm. Oh, it's a fascinating story. It yeah. is, wow. absolutely. That was definitely a turning point, I would say. Well, i got to tell you this story. Last month I was at the Bullock State Muse- um, Historical Museum in Austin, Texas, with my grandchildren and my daughter-in-law. And my, um, they're having a World War exhibit, World War I exhibit right now. And it was the first thing that we went into when we went to the museum. And, of course, one of the first um, parts of the exhibit was the sinking of the Lusitania. And and then it went on, and there were parts about the barbed wire and the um, the trenches. And I wanted to talk a little bit about 
the trench warfare because that was an important part of this book too you know where you describe what it was like in the trenches but um and we're going as we're going through these exhibits my granddaughter is getting visibly upset by it mm. and and she's six years old and she said to me were we here then or no she said was this here then and i'm like what do you mean and and i i got from her the meaning she meant was like texas there was austin there was our her home was it you know was this so long ago that we didn't exist or were he were we here then i said yeah we were here uh -huh. then. and she said well why didn't they just come here where it was safe oh <laughs> bless her heart i know Oh, it's hard. It's hard to talk about these realities of war. And, you know, I, I know I said earlier that um, I don't really consider the age of readership much. You know, when I write a book, I, I try to just tell the truth and tell the story that needs to be told. But I will say that there were some aspects of the war, and I, and I feel like I, you know, exposed quite a lot of its of its horrors and atrocities, but there were some things I just couldn't bring myself to talk mm -hmm. about. You know? just mm -hmm. some some aspects that i i hesitated to to share and i'm not even sure that i would have done differently if i had thought that i was writing only for adults i mean mm -hmm. there're just some some aspects that are so so ugly but yes trench warfare is one of them and i i tried to yeah. kind of show the way that it changed people's thinking the way that that they became quite literally different creatures in the trenches and that they had to in order to survive. And mm -hmm. and that, you know, the the utter lack of sleep. They they slept in twenty minute intervals if they were lucky. They they, you know, were in in combat mode day and night and they worked all night and they, you know, they kind of dozed and worked <laughs> during the day and uh just that alone, think what that would do to the mental health of all those people, plus the constant bombardment of of artillery, you know, weaponry and, and you know, snipers and, and the unsanitary conditions and the dismal food and the cold and the heat and the lice and, you know, the, the, the monotony, the dreary monotony of it all. And, I mean, it just was so shattering to their um, sense of self and to their moral compass. And some At the people same never time, made it back from that. They never recovered oh, from that. Right, yeah. and to, to watch your friends be killed. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. In spite of the horrors of it, incredible friendships and bonds formed. I mean, that the, the sort of band of brother band of brothers phenomena was, was strong, and these, these ties that they forged were deep. And then they had to, you know, forge these ties and then watch, you know, the, the dismembered body of their friend be carried by in a stretcher. I mean, how, how do you survive that? How do you, how do you psychologically survive that? Well, Julie, there's a lot more we could talk about here. And also, you know, we didn't even get into the whole, really, the conditions of the African-American soldiers when they came, which is an, also a very important part of this story. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and we didn't get a chance to ask you about, you know, how you got started writing or how you first got published, which we would love to hear. <laughs> but we're out of time. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This has been such a pleasure. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. And, Mom, do you have some closing words for us? Well, I'll tell you, there was, I, I had trouble finding something, but uh, I, this is something that we can all think about. If you live a good, honorable life, when you get older, you can think back and you'll enjoy it a second time. <laughs> that is true. That's true. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Mom. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices.